Good evening. <laughs> well, that's all right. This is the first night of our 1959 London closed class. I wonder if you realize how many classes we have had in London and in Manchester, open classes and closed classes, since this work began here in England. In thinking of this today, the thought that came uppermost was this. Each year, the class groups have become larger. And yet, very few have fallen away from the message of the infinite way since we began. Each year, those who have come have remained. Some few have gone, surely, but for the most part, you have remained. And to the number, still more. This class, there are very, very few who are taking our classwork for the first time. I think that is the most remarkable part of this entire experience. It is natural, first of all, that there be small classes because of the nature of the work, because of that which is really demanded of the students, not by me, but by the message. It is natural that some fall away because the demands are too great. <clears throat> the whole principle of the infinite way is one in which the goal is dying daily, being reborn of the spirit. And it isn't given to everyone, more especially in this age, to be able to do that because this is the age of the go-getter. This is the age of the great personalities. This is the great day of the great I am's. And those who can understand that the true greatness, the true wisdom, the true success lies in the very opposite of glorifying the self of pushing forward the personality. This is an achievement. I would like to read you what really constitutes the ultimate goal of our work, that which really becomes our life eventually. And I'm sure that you will find why it is that so many must fall away and why those who remain will go to the highest degree of spiritual consciousness, spiritual awareness, and spiritual demonstration. This is something I gave to a small group of students, all of our most advanced students, some years ago. On the table was a glass of ice water, a glass of water in which was a square of ice. 
Look at this glass of water with the ice floating on it. Notice how the ice is resting in that water, cradled in it. The ice has no power to move itself. Only the water can propel it from one place to another. The ice itself is quiescent, immobile, passive. Its every motion dependent upon the movement of the water. We are the ice, and consciousness is the water. The archer who practices this form of meditation waits for consciousness to move his hand and arm. He does not move them then every motion is unerring. If the archer attempted by mental calculation of the distance and by correct timing to perform this action himself, his hand might well falter and the arrow miss its target. But when he remains immobile until consciousness moves the hand and arm, there is no faltering, and the arrow is sent right to the heart of the target. As long as we try to direct our thoughts or our actions, the effect will be haphazard, good and bad, successful and unsuccessful. A state of complete quiescence in which there is no thinking or planning must be reached. We must be as completely passive as the piece of ice. Such a state can only be achieved when all desire has been surrendered. Do I know the will of God? Certainly not. My will would be to see everyone instantly healed. But would that result in their awakening to spiritual values, in the opening of the soul? No. I must sit back and wait patiently for the will of God to make itself known. Desire nourishes the sense of I-ness. In I-ness, there can be no is-ness. Yesterday and tomorrow must be discarded in now-ness. As long as there is a desire, there is a projection into the future. As long as there is a regret, there is a return to the past, both of which are dead, without substance and without life. Now is the only life. Now is the only reality. Now is the only time. The future is only an extension of the now. Sap must flow up from the roots of the trees into the branches to form the buds, flowers, and leaves of the trees. However, if there could be a tree consciousness which worried about whether or not there would be enough rain or sun in due season, it would interfere with a normal and natural flow of life. So do we interfere with the free flowing of life by injecting I-ness into the already completed picture, an I-ness which manifests as fear of the past or future, concern, anxiety, desire. There can be no desire, not even the desire to give, for that too 
feeds the sense of I-ness and bloats the ego. There must be a complete resting as the ice rests in the water, letting the water project the ice wherever and whenever it will. You may think at first that this is an impossible life to live, and that it is impractical in the modern world of business or government. <clears throat> On the contrary, it is the most practical form of life ever evolved. The reason is that any other form of life is based on that very I-ness. In other words, it would be dependent upon my personal experience, my education, my vision, my idea of what is right and wrong, my idea of what is timely. A right idea at the wrong time is of no use. Therefore, in the degree that I can relax, attain an inner silence, quiet, peace, I can be led of the Spirit, I can be influenced by an infinite wisdom, an infinite intelligence, an infinite power, and then my actions really become the carrying out of the divine will, not mine. It responds in the right time, in the right manner. The difference between living that life of I-ness, I, me, mine, and the spiritual life is really the difference between failure and success permanent success, rather than some temporary sense of success. This ability to be still and let the Lord speak within us, let divine grace move us, this ability assures us that I am living, yet not I. Christ is living my life. My life is God-governed, God-directed, God-impelled. At first, it seems difficult to make the transition from the ordinary I life to this life of spiritual guidance, spiritual protection. But actually, it only takes a few months of real serious endeavor to come at least to a place where we can gradually take on this divine guidance, divine will, divine movement. Speak, Lord. To be able to retire into that quiet, is a practice that should not be of more than, at the most, two or three minutes. 
probably even one or one and a half minutes would be better. But repeated as many times in the day and evening as it is possible to be alone for one or one and a half minutes and uh, to be repeated at night any time and every time that one may awaken from sleep. Surely early in the morning again. And the reason is that if we make a habit of turning within, even for that one minute, we are preparing our own consciousness for the experience of receiving. Now you see, living the human life has cut us off from the kingdom of God which is within us. All that we are doing is re-establishing a contact with this withinness in which our entire good is already established. Let us put it this way. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. The kingdom of God is not to be found in holy mountains nor temples in Jerusalem. The kingdom of God is to be found within you. Now, we who accept, who have responded to this message of the infinite way, we are compelled to acknowledge that this is the full and complete truth, that it is a living truth, that it is an eternal truth, that it is now the truth, that the kingdom of God is within us. And as, Brown, as Tennyson has told us, Browning, isn't it? Browning. That this truth is within ourselves, it is within ourselves in all of its fullness, completeness, perfection. This means our lives are established within ourselves. The fullness of life, the completeness and the perfection of life is already established within ourselves from everlasting to everlasting. If we were to live a thousand years on earth, our completeness for that length of time is already established within us. Fulfillment, infinite supply, infinite wisdom, infinite grace. But we must open out a way for this infinite splendor to escape. Infinite, infinite, infinite. Now, how do we open out a way for infinite wisdom, eternal life, divine love to flow out from us? The way in which we start is to acknowledge that it is there. The kingdom of God is within ourselves. Therefore, we are not to attempt to get, obtain, achieve from without. We are to center our attention on bringing it forth, or rather letting it escape from within our own being. Then, every time that we close our eyes, even if it is for 15 seconds, and acknowledge the kingdom of God is within me, speak, Lord, let it flow, and then return to our work, whatever its nature, whether it's housekeeping, whether it is music, art, invention, science, government, return and be active in whatever work we have been given to do today. 
We have no thought about tomorrow. We are not to take thought for tomorrow, or what we shall eat or drink or wherewithal we shall be clothed. All we are called upon to do is to live in this moment and to live in the assurance that full Christhood, full spiritual being, is established within us and uh, that within us is the bread, the meat, the wine, the water, everything, the resurrection, life eternal, everything of which we shall have need, not only for the rest of our days on earth, but for all of our days unto kingdom come. This, you see, is making a transition from the ordinary sense of human life in which we look to others for our good. We look to husbands or wives or children or parents. We look to investments and in this last decade it has become fashionable to look to the government. Whereas in the spiritual life we are taught to look within ourselves and let God's grace flow out from us. Now, no one can be expected to demonstrate beyond the capacity they have attained. Therefore, we do not try to walk on the waters until we have been given an inner assurance that we may attempt it. We do not start <coughs> with, well, I will go out and run up a lot of bills because now God within me is going to meet them. No, rather, rather open out a way and let the money flow in first and then go out and spend it. Be assured of each step of your demonstration as you go along. Oh, if the still small voice tells you to take a step which you at the moment cannot humanly see as right, you can afford to forget your human thought about it and follow the direction that you receive from within. The infinite way was founded on that. At every step, the still small voice directed the next step, a step which did not seem humanly reasonable or possible but it was accomplished. But that was only after the contact within was so certain that there never was a question when the voice spoke, it was the voice. And when it spoke, it accomplished that which it sent me out to do. It never left me with the responsibility of doing something. It performed that which it gave me to do. So the time does come when you need take no thought for what the appearances testify to, but just obey that still small voice. Now, <clears throat> at first, it may appear to you that this oft turning within is not producing any effect. Well, that's why I can't play piano. I started to take lessons and after playing scales for a year, I couldn't notice that I was able to play piano, so I stopped taking lessons. If only I had continued a few more years, just think, by now I might be invortable.
You see, as we turn to the spiritual life, it differs so completely from our human experience that you are really setting out on an uncharted sea. Not that others haven't been there before you, but that you cannot go by their maps. You have to have your own experience, and therefore you have to walk slowly, move forward slowly and patiently. Above all things, from this moment on, we must never declare that anything is beyond our ability. We must not accept any sense of limitation. We must not accept the belief that any good is beyond our capacity or reach, or that any heights are too high to attain. For there are no limits to the I which I am after I have made contact with it. It becomes literally true that I live, yet not I. Christ, the infinite, the unlimited, the unbounded, the unfettered lives my life. Now, once you start on this path, you must take into the silence with you a word which in the human scene is not understood and which can only be revealed to you, the meaning of it can only be revealed to you from within yourself. It is for this reason that we must not use this word in the connection I'm going to give it to you, outwardly or openly. We must use it as the Hebrews taught in the very earliest days of their experience, silently, secretly, sacredly, and then when its meaning has been made clear to us, we will understand why we never can voice it in this way except within ourselves. The word is I. What follows is the absolute truth about the I that I am. If I were to say this about Joel, I would be speaking a lie. but I can speak it about the I that I am, the I that I really am, the I which is one with God. This I that I am in the depths of my inner being this I is the bread, the wine, the meat, the water, the resurrection. Unto me eternally. Therefore, anything in all of this world of which I may ever seem to have need is already established in the I that I am, and I need not look outside to man whose breath is in his nostril or to princes. I can place entire faith, confidence, 
reliance, assurance on this truth. I embody within myself infinity. All that the Father hath is embodied in the I that I am. I am ever with the Father, and therefore all that the Father hath is mine, embodied within me, embodied in the very I that I am, for I and the Father are one. As long as Joel abides in this truth, he is fed, clothed, housed, prospered, completed, perfected by the I that I am. Now Joel and I are one, but I is greater than Joel. Therefore Joel of himself is nothing, but by relationship to the I that is within me, Joel has access to all that the Father hath. For this I and the Father are one and not two. This I and the Father are one and not two. Therefore, though Joel can of himself do nothing, the I that I am doeth the works. God presence, God power. This is the substance of individual you and me. And wherever I have used the name Joel, you may use your own name. And realize this. You, Mary, you, William, you, Robert, and the Father are one. And I, in the midst of thee, am mighty. That I which you declare, that I in the midst of you, is mighty. In proportion as you understand that I and the Father are one, in that proportion do you understand that all that the Father hath is mine. The mind of God is mine. The life of God is my life. The soul of God is my only soul. There can only be one spirit, one life, one soul. And that is mine, that is yours. Wherever the word I can be voiced, that I is consciously one with the spirit which is God, the soul, the life, the substance, the wisdom, the power, the dominion. In that way we were taught in Genesis that we were given dominion over the earth, the waters, the sky, and all that is therein. We were not given that dominion as of ourselves, but by virtue of the I that I am, the I that is within me, the I that constitutes my individual being. That is why, then, Joel can rest as if he were a piece of ice floating on the water. And let the water move him. Let the water become substance of his being, activity, quality and quantity. As we realize this, and we learn to sit in the morning in our period of quiet, you can now see the 
purpose of your meditation. As you are sitting for your first meditation in the morning, you are realizing that God has made this day. God has perfected it. God has decreed its activity. And the Father within you is the law and the substance and the activity of this day and of all of your life during this day. And so you are now receptive to its grace. Thy grace is my sufficiency in all things. Thy grace, closer to me than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, Thy presence goes before me. Thy presence is with me. All that thou art, I am. Thy will be done in me today. Thy grace is my sufficiency today. Thy presence is my assurance. And now to be sure that I love my neighbor as myself, this is the truth also about my neighbor. My close by neighbor, my far distant neighbor, my friendly neighbor and my enemy neighbor. This is a universal truth. Now you see, with that, even with that short meditation, you have fulfilled the purpose of scripture. You have denied yourself as if you of yourself were anything. You have acknowledged God in all your ways. You have acknowledged the presence of God, the power of God, the life of God, the wisdom of God, the direction of God, the protection of God. You have realized that you do not live your life alone, but Christ liveth your life. You have made yourself receptive and responsive to the spiritual influence that is closer to you than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. You have brought yourself to the realization that it makes no difference what the day's experiences may be. If you mount up to heaven, I will be there. But if for some reason you have to go into hell, I also am there. Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this very I is there. And uh, this I is my food, my clothing, my housing. My daily work, my daily activity isn't for the purpose of earning a living. It is for the purpose of showing forth God's handiwork. It is for the purpose of fulfilling God's purpose in me. Ah, uh, yes, I know. Very few in the human world are at this moment performing their spiritual activity or the activity which approximates it. Therefore, they must do that which is given them to do today and let the future take care of itself by acknowledging God today, as Brother Lawrence brought it out, even in scrubbing the floor or cooking in the kitchen, even acknowledging God in these activities which seem so mundane, even in this we are bringing God into actual expression. 
And then you may be assured that we will be led from that activity to another and another and another until we are being fulfilled spiritually. Now, regardless of where we may be today, and I am addressing this not only to you, but to the man in prison, those in hospitals, those in mental institutes, Wherever you are today, wherever you are at this minute, disregard the appearances and declare for yourself, the kingdom of God is within me. Therefore, the place whereon I stand is holy ground. up in heaven, down in hell, in prison, in the valley of the shadow of death, where I am is holy ground. Here and now, in this very place, regardless of appearances to the contrary, here where I am, God is. Closer to me than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, and starting with this acknowledgement and recognizing that I in the midst of me is very God being, one with God. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. And when you say I, remember I, that I, and the Father are one and not two. I, the I that you declare, I, that I, and the Father are one and not two, and all that the Father hath is yours. What the appearances are, I have nothing to do with at this moment. What the condition of the purse may be, I have nothing to do at this moment. Whether you are prisoner or free, sick or well, living or dead, I have nothing to do with that. That is the appearance of this moment, and I am picking you up where you are at this moment. And from this moment on, I, in the midst of you, will lead you, direct you, govern, feed, clothe, house. Only remember that this must be brought to your conscious remembrance. You must abide in this word. You must let this word abide in you. You must dwell in the secret place of the Most High. You must live and move and have your being in this consciousness that I and the Father are one, and all that the Father hath is mine, here and now, where I am. And as you continue to disregard the appearances, don't try to change them or improve them. Stand fast where you are and let the Spirit move you as you are prepared for it. Just a few weeks ago, I spoke to a group of men who were behind bars. And I said, I know that you are hoping that I can tell you how to get out of here or that I have the power to release you. I won't tell you how to get out of here, and if I have the power to release you, I won't. You must be released from here only through a change of consciousness. Then we'll both be sure you won't return. So it is. To leave the place where you are now in the same consciousness in which you are now would serve no purpose because without a higher consciousness of truth, 
you would eventually return to the same place where you are at this moment. The master said, neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. In other words, don't try to live beyond your attained state of consciousness because you will not be able to retain it. Therefore, where you are now is good enough. Then abide in this truth that I, in the midst of me, is one with God. I, in the midst of me, being one with God, is heir of God, joint heir to all the heavenly riches, all that the Father hath is mine. Then, as you abide in this truth, your consciousness becomes enriched, deepened, broadened. Your consciousness becomes filled with spiritual truth, and spiritual truth, as you will discover, is the I. I am the truth. And this truth which fills your consciousness literally appears outwardly as the greater harmonies in your experience. Now you see, you must know the truth in order for the truth to make you free. Regardless of what sense of limitation may be binding you, nothing is going to free you except knowing the truth. Knowing the truth is something far more than reading it in a book or reading statements Knowing the truth means exactly that, knowing the truth. Now, as you take this truth into your consciousness, as you live it and relive it, as you ponder it, meditate upon it, cogitate, you will find that gradually, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, Truths become alive in you. They take on an entirely different nature than just statements of truth. They become living truth itself. And this is when the demonstration of God's presence comes forward into active expression. So remember this. You have only one demonstration to make. Do not make the metaphysical mistake of trying to demonstrate things or persons or conditions. You have but one demonstration to make, and that is the conscious realization of the presence of the I that I am as one with God. You have only to realize the presence of God and that realization will appear externally as fulfillment. Seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things will appear outwardly in your experience, but the things can't appear without the attainment of this kingdom of God. That is why in this message of the infinite way, we have one only one real demonstration to make, and that is the conscious realization of truth, the consciousness of the presence of the I that I am, the realization of God's presence. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Therefore, the only demonstration we have to make is to find ourselves in thy presence. But this thy presence we are talking about is already present. It is already the I within our own being. Therefore, we don't have to bring God to us. We have to bring ourselves to God-realization to the realization of God's presence within our 
very own being. At every step this week, <clears throat> we are going to remember that it is in knowing the truth that we find our freedom, and therefore we are devoting this week to consciously knowing the truth, consciously knowing every truth necessary to the development of our spiritual consciousness every truth necessary to the building of a spiritual awareness within us, consciously knowing every truth necessary to bringing forth spiritual consciousness, healing consciousness. We are attempting this week to bring forth from within ourselves our healing consciousness. It is already there. But there are certain specific truths which we must know, which we must abide in, which we must let abide in us in order that this healing consciousness may be evolved. The message of the infinite way has two parts. Its first part is its metaphysics. This we call the letter of truth. The letter of truth which we consciously know, remember, declare in order that we may build the consciousness of truth. The consciousness of truth is the mystical side of this message. The metaphysical side is the letter of truth. The mystical side is the consciousness of truth, that which is attained through realization or attainment, sometimes called illumination. Perhaps better understood in the word realization. Now, we may have a realization about one facet of truth, and we may bring forth mighty works through that, but never believe when you have had a realization of truth, even illumination that you have gone the full distance, you have only started on the path. Afterward, there comes realizations of other truths or facets of truth, more realizations, deeper realizations, and actually, this goes on forever, and so far as I know, it never ends. This must be so because of the very infinite nature of God. God must then forever be imparting itself to us, infinitely imparting itself to us. And I wonder if we ever do attain that place where we know it all. Personally, I doubt it. But I'm willing to be taught. The beginning of wisdom is when you know that all that you are seeking is already established within you and that you are seeking only to bring it forth from within your own being. This will always prevent idolatry. It will prevent you from false gods false Christs. It will prevent you from worshiping something or someone outside your own being. It will likewise prevent your fearing. As long as you realize that the kingdom of God is within you, you need fear no man 
You need have no fear what mortal man can do to you, what mortal circumstance can do to you, what mortal condition can do to you. Fear must lessen and eventually fade away as you realize the nature of the I that I am within you. As you realize God's presence within you, you never can fear anything external to you, nor can you worship anything or anybody external to you, for the kingdom of God is within you. All that the Father hath is embodied in that I within you. In these one minute, one and a half minute periods of meditation, which you are to experience as, experience as many times a day as you can consciously bring yourself to remember it, always remember that your first thought must be the kingdom of God is within me, and all that God is, I am. All that God has is mine, for I and the Father are one. And if you have no time for anything else, you will be all right. You will have made a contact, and uh, you will have prepared the way for the imprisoned splendor, the infinite imprisoned splendor, to escape. We always begin with what we have. Never acknowledge that you don't know enough truth. Never acknowledge that you haven't enough of truth or anything else. One statement of truth is enough to complete your entire life's demonstration. Why? If you make use of the one truth that you have, it will multiply itself. This is the secret of supply in any direction whether it is the supply of truth or the supply of money or the supply of homes or transportation. You start with what you have and you make use of what you have. The master of the Old Testament says to the poor widow, what have you in the house. And so she starts to pour just these few drops of oil, and the cruis never runs dry. The master in the New Testament says, when he has multitudes to feed, what have we? We have a few loaves and fishes. Begin, begin, start pouring them, break, Share, give, just what you have. Don't hope that you have ten times as much. Don't wish. Be satisfied. Start with what you have and begin to pour. And if you only can remember one statement of truth, take that one statement of truth into your consciousness and live with it. Ponder it. Meditate upon it. Keep it within you. And soon you will find, even if you never discover how it happened, that that one statement of truth has a companion. Another statement has come into your awareness. When that happens, you need never again fear 
you have proven the multiplication of what you have. Good evening. The question has been asked why it is that so few mystics in the world's history have been healers. Why is it that one can have action, act, actual conscious contact with God and still not become a healer? The answer is that almost all of the mystics of whom we have actual records have had a religious background. And this it is that prevents their becoming healers. In other words, their religious background has instilled in them the belief that God is a great power and that God does something to other powers called sin or disease or wars or lack. There is that belief in all religious teachings that you can turn to God and have God do something for you. And this, of course, is the barrier which makes spiritual healing impossible. First place, God has no such relationship to man or to the earth. And unless one knows the nature of God and the nature of man, it is an impossibility to attain the necessary consciousness which results in healing. Now, I must illustrate that for you. God, the great I am, spirit, soul, consciousness, that which we call the creative principle of man and of the universe, the creative, maintaining, and sustaining principle is infinite, infinite intelligence, divine love. And into this realm of God, nothing ever enters that defileth or maketh a lie. Nothing ever enters the kingdom of God that needs healing, improving, reforming, supplying. God is of two pure eyes to behold iniquity. God has no consciousness whatsoever of a world that needs improving, of a world at war, of a world in poverty. Imagine if you can what would be the nature of a God that could watch these last three wars through which we've gone and do nothing about it? Just let it go on, aware of it. Heaven forbid that there should be such a God. If God had the power to stop these wars, these bombings, the poverty, the slavery in some parts of the world, and didn't stop it, God would be a fiend, not a god. And if God didn't have the power to stop it, God certainly wouldn't be a god. 
one or the other. If God had the power to stop it and didn't, it could not be God. If God had the power to stop it and didn't, God would be a fiend. Not even a human parent could watch this carnage and permit it to go on if they could stop it. Therefore, unless an individual can understand that God is infinite good, the infinite intelligence of the universe, divine love, one has no understanding of God, no correct understanding of God, even if one had a feeling of God's presence, which mystics do have, an actual awareness of it. Yet there is a blind spot in them, a barrier, which prevents their overcoming the old belief that you can look to God to do something for the people of earth. When you understand God as spirit, omnipresence, you understand then that man is all that God is, that God constitutes man, and all that the Father hath is thine. And then you understand why there is no need to pray to God for anything, no need to expect anything of God. The need is that we come into the orbit of God, the nature of God, the realm of God, by becoming sons of God. As a human being, the creature, you are not under the law of God, neither indeed can be. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you, then do you become the sons of God. Then are you under God's grace. <clears throat> As this creature... living in a world, accepting the belief in two powers, the Master well describes us, a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth. That is the entire human race. Until the individual, by abiding in the Word and letting the Word abide in them, dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, living and moving and having your being in God, is reestablished as the Son of God, living by grace. Surely Saul of Tarsus was not living by grace. And he knew great miseries and great unhappiness. Hatred, persecution filled his consciousness. But St. Paul could say, I live yet not I. God, the Christ, liveth my life. I live by grace. I can do all things through Christ. In other words, now I have contact with my spiritual source. Now I am consciously one with the source of all life, all being. And I can now relax, take no thought for my life, because now there is this Father within that performeth everything that is given me to do feedeth me, leadeth me, 
beside the still waters, maketh me to lie down in green pastures. None of this is true of the creature. None of this is true of uh, the person running their automobile into brick fences, stumbling down the street with alcohol, robbing banks, inflicting evil upon each other, brawling in their homes or in their business. This is not the Son of God living under the grace of God. This is a branch of the tree that is cut off and withereth. But because of the grace of God, that same individual may later say, Though my sins were scarlet, I am now white as snow. Though I was the prodigal eating with the swine, eating husks, branch of a tree cut off, withering, now I am restored to my father's house and once more wear the ring and the robe of authority and sonship. And so with us, Though we were mortals, though we were sinners, though we lived the normal life of a human being, sometimes good and sometimes bad, sometimes rich and sometimes poor, sometimes healthy and sometimes sick, by virtue, first of all, of a divine grace that turned our thought toward God and the continuing grace which led us until in some specific moment there was an awakening. And in that awakening, we were restored to our original relationship as one with the vine. The vine is one with God. And now, all of the Godhead bodily is flowing into us, through us, and out from us by virtue of our conscious oneness with God. Now, as long as we entertain a belief that God can do something for this branch that is cut off from the tree, this withering human race. All of this praying, all of this church going, all of this being religious amounts to nothing more than making us good humans. It can do that. Indeed, it can. To receive correct instruction can always make us good humans. And it's far better to be a good human than a bad one, although very often it is the bad one who has the best chance of being restored to his Christhood because he's driven, whereas the good one usually can be so content and so peaceful in that human goodness. Just as disease serious disease is more responsible for people being returned to divine sonship than health ever was. Now, I would like for a moment to return to last night. I'm sure that many of you must have thought of our glass of water with its floating piece of ice. And I'm wondering if you also consciously remembered that the water is H2O and ice is H2O. The substance of the water and the substance of the ice are the same. And all that is of water is of ice. Whatever water has, ice has. 
These are not two separate substances. These are not two separate qualities. Ice and water are one. Two different forms, yes, but they are one. One in essence, one in substance, one in quality. The ice does not turn to the water for anything that the ice hasn't already got. And yet the water, in this particular case, is an activity of the ice, since the ice as form has no activity of its own. Now we bring you to an exact relationship between man and God. It is true that God is invisible to human eyesight, but God is the substance in which we live and move and have our being, and God is the substance of which we are formed Therefore, the qualities of God are the qualities of man, and yet God is always the greater, for God is the law and the activity of man. To understand this makes you see that in your spiritual identity, all that God is, you are. And therefore, there is no need to turn to God for something. There is only the need to recognize this relationship and then create within yourself a vacuum so that you can say, I of myself am nothing. It is only the quality of God which is my being the substance and essence of God, and it is the law of God which governs me, guides, directs, instructs. Then you can understand why the Master could say, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one, and yet I and the Father are one, but the Father is greater than I. The nature of our being is the same as the nature of God's being, for we are one. And yet, relaxing in that oneness, we permit the invisible. to uphold us, sustain us, move us, feed us, clothe us, house us, direct us, instruct us. We learn to relax and let God's grace govern us. Now, there's quite a difference between this and thinking of ourselves as something separate and apart from God, having to ask God instruct God, influence God. Quite a difference. All the difference between successful spiritual living and non-successful living of any type. God's grace is my sufficiency. This is a truth. But God's grace is not brought into experience by this praying to God in the sense of asking, pleading, seeking, but rather God's grace is brought into our experience by relaxing. Relaxing into an atmosphere of speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Now try for a moment to understand that at this very moment 
You live and move and have your being in God. Try to understand that in this room, right here where we are, we are relaxing not in a chair and not in the air, but we are relaxing in God, the invisible. You can't see it, hear it, taste it, touch it, smell it, but through faith, through an inner conviction, you can understand that the place whereon I stand is holy ground, that where I am God is, that God is neither low here nor low there, but the kingdom of God is within me, right where I am. And then feeling that, relax. Now you know that the God that made this universe, that formed it, that gave it its laws, is certainly capable of maintaining and sustaining your identity and mine unto eternity. Therefore, it is necessary to relax in it, closer to me than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. And now, since God is the infinite intelligence of this universe, let God's intelligence move us as it will, feed us, clothe us, house us, direct us, resurrect us, restore the lost years of the locust, return us to the Father's house. Let thy will be done in me. Without any idea at all, of any need for telling God what we need or what we would like, without any idea at all of advising God as to what we should have or what we think we should have or what, we even, what even we would like to have. Not at all. Let us acknowledge God as infinite intelligence and divine love and say, I'm satisfied with that. I'm satisfied to be what you want me to be, to do what you want me to do, to be where you want me to be. Thy grace is my sufficiency. Let me so understand the nature of God that I too can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I know that he leadeth me beside the still waters without my asking, without my directing. But I must relax in his consciousness. I must relax in his spirit, in his wisdom, in his judgment, in his will. And this in mystical language is called self-surrender. Yielding. Dying daily not having a will of my own, a desire of my own, not even a care of my own, but always living in, in the realization I live and move and have my being in God consciousness. It is closer to me than breathing, therefore it knoweth my needs before I do, or he knoweth my needs before I do. It is his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. And I can rest in that word, relax in that word. And then you will see that you are now developing a healing consciousness because now you are not seeking a God power. You are living in a God power and you are not acknowledging a power that has to be overcome. Now you are getting back to the fullness of mysticism in which we learn that evil has no existence at all outside of the mind that believes in good and evil. And that is, of course, what has been called the carnal mind or mortal mind, mesmeric mind, and other names it has in different literature. But the mind that is composed of good and evil, that is capable of good and evil, 
that believes in the power of good and evil, this is not the healing consciousness. And so the healing consciousness only comes to those who arrive at a state of consciousness in which they can live consciously one with God in full and complete confidence that God is the mind, the intelligence, the wisdom, the love, infinite, therefore needing no help from us, and that in this God consciousness there is nothing to battle with God, nothing to war with God, nothing for God to overcome. Sometimes it is helpful to have a specific statement and the one that is the most helpful to me is remembering Paul's statement that the carnal mind is enmity against God. I can laugh. I can. It brings a smile to my face and I can relax. How foolish can you be? Enmity against God. Where is God's infinity? Where is God's all power? And who created this enemy of God's? God made all that was made. God looked upon all that he made and found it good. Where then do you get a power to war with God? And you will find, as you are called upon for help, or as you attempt to give help, that you will only succeed in proportion as you reach an inner state of grace in which you do not battle error, you do not war with mortal mind or carnal mind, you do not seek to use truth over error, you rest in this word, you abide in God. And in the realization there is no enmity in God, there is no power in anything that God did not make. Therefore, there is no need for a God power to overcome or destroy or remove or reform. When you are abiding in the consciousness of God as omnipresence, here and now, where I am, as you abide in the consciousness of God as the creative, maintaining, and sustaining power of the universe, as you abide in this consciousness of God with no opposition, no enmity, no powers to overcome, something takes place within you. It is a fourth dimensional experience or a mystical experience in which there is a real realization. Of course, God is all. It's an actual experience, no longer just an affirmation or a statement in a book. It is an experience. Of course, how could there be God and uh, something else? And in that moment of spiritual union, and for that is really what it is, in that moment of spiritual union, everything that had existence as evil dissolves. Now, so that you do not misunderstand this, let me repeat. In the world of human beings, there are two powers. On the physical level of life, there are two powers. Physical force or material force can be used for good and it can be used for evil. On the mental plane, the power of the mind, the power of thought can be used for good and it can be used for evil. And that is what you witness as you look out upon this world. That's what you're aware of all the time. An automobile is a good material force 
while it's behaving in, the, in its right place in the road and under good conscious direction, it becomes an evil material force the moment it's out of control and probably hits someone. Electricity can give you power, warmth, cold, but it can kill. Everything that is of the material realm can be used for good or evil. And the mind, the mind of man can be used for good or evil. Always has been. Always has been. Back in the... Uh, earlier days of the Aborigines of Australia, you had them with such complete knowledge of mind power that they could bless, but they could also curse and kill just with the power of their mind. The Hawaiians had the good kahunas that could heal and the bad kahunas who could kill. There have been sects of people in uh, most parts of the world where there were original natives, primitive people, and all of these knew the power of mind and how to use it for good or evil. Now, this knowledge of mind was lost so that the Western nations never knew about it. And even to this day, there are very, very few people in the Western world who know the nature of mind or its powers. I might say here that psychologists and psychiatrists know absolutely nothing about the power of the mind. They are a million miles even from getting to the kindergarten stage of a knowledge of mind. But there are a few people who have experimented, who have not been limited by the misknowledge of psychology and psychiatry. And these people have discovered the powers and abilities of the mind. In some places, there are plans afoot to use this power for the good of mankind and in other places, they are now planning behind very plush doors to use it destructively for mankind, for selfish purposes, which of course will be evil purposes. Now, at the present time, however, very little is known about the mind in the Western world. But of this, you may be sure, Mind and the power of thought can be used for good. In this last 75, 80, 90 years, mind has been used for healing work, and it has performed good healing works. So then, in the material world, you have two powers, good and evil, in material force. In the mental world, you have two powers, good and evil, mind power, thought power. The secret of life is that in the presence of God, in the presence of spiritual consciousness, neither material power nor mental power is power. They both dissolve in the presence of spiritual consciousness. When an individual brings themselves to Jesus Christ, the discords, whether of sinful nature or sickly nature, dissolve. The limitations of the body dissolve, disappear. So in our modern day, all spiritual healers can bear witness to the fact 
that they know nothing of the nature of any power with which to overcome sin or disease or lack or inharmonious human relationships, but that in proportion as they can attain their inner stillness without any sense of power, the discords evaporate. We have, as the simplest of problems, colds and grip and flu, and every metaphysical healing is a proof that germs are not evil powers and that infection or contagion cannot operate. Now remember, it does operate in the human scene. It stops operating the moment it comes up against spiritual consciousness. On no other basis can healing take place than that these destructive powers of germs disappear. Day before yesterday, I received a letter from the States. <clears throat> Two or three months ago, a lady wrote asking for help. She had cataracts and was so blind that she could not walk on the streets without someone to lead her. And the day before yesterday, I received a letter written in her own handwriting without wearing glasses. Now, you know, you have heard me say so often, I don't know how to heal. I wouldn't know how to remove cataracts. I wouldn't know how to restore that woman's eyesight. No, I know how to abide in inner stillness and to remember that in the presence of God there is no evil to be uh, healed or removed or touched or reformed, that there are no powers but spiritual powers and there are no laws but spiritual laws. Therefore, laws of matter or laws of mind cannot operate. In that consciousness, something happens and outwardly we call it healing. So it is. You know how many of you have written to me in these past years and you know that sitting 10,000 miles away from you no power was being exerted over you or in you and now you must understand what did operate the realization that there is no material power and no mental power that is a power. In the realization of God as one infinite all power. Now that's what, that is what constitutes spiritual consciousness. Spiritual consciousness isn't anything uh, mysterious. It is something sacred, it is something secret, but it isn't mysterious. Spiritual consciousness is your consciousness in proportion as you no longer give power to physical force or mental force. In proportion as you understand God as the only force and then take the attitude of Jesus Christ, resist not evil or visualizing if you can Jesus turning to this crippled man and saying what did hinder you what did hinder you rise pick up your bed and walk in other words there's no power holding you there and one with God is a majority therefore the consciousness of a Jesus Realizing 
that this which the world calls material power or mental power, either one, is not power. In the early days of my practice, I think that unconsciously I accepted the fact that material power wasn't power, but that mental power was power. It took me about two years for the revelation to be given me that mental power isn't any more power than material power. As a matter of fact, there wouldn't be any material power if there wasn't some kind of a mentality to move it, to be the power. And so really, mental power and physical power is one. That's why it has often been said that thoughts are things. But actually, mental power is no more power than physical power is in the presence of the consciousness which knows that spirit is the only power. Spirit, God, and spiritual law is the only law. And spiritual life is the only life. In proportion, then, as we realize that the transformation takes place in what we call the outer world, but it isn't an outer world because there isn't any outer world. The only world there is is an inner world. God is consciousness, one infinite consciousness, and because you and I are conscious, this is definite proof that God is your consciousness and my consciousness. Therefore, we have one and the same consciousness, all of us, God. Therefore, everything that exists is embodied in this one consciousness, which is God, but now go a step further, the one consciousness which is my consciousness. That is why you are embodied in my consciousness as this class. I am embodied in your consciousness as teacher or friend. Don't think we are outside of consciousness. Oh no, we are consciousness itself. But because there is only one consciousness, that is my consciousness and yours. Therefore, everything is subject to this one consciousness which I am, which you are. Now follow this. <clears throat> there are states and stages of consciousness and those of material state of consciousness believe that physical force is power. And they do everything through physical force. They might even earn their living through physical force, physical energies, physical labors. Then there is the person who has gone a step further and has more of a mental consciousness. And this person begins to earn their living through mental powers and exert mental powers, personality, individuality. And then, of course, there is the spiritual consciousness, the one that we recognize as that mind which was also in Christ Jesus, the consciousness which does not live by might or by power, not by physical might, nor by mental power, but by my spirit. This is spiritual consciousness. The individual who lives not by might, nor by power, not by any human effort, but by my spirit. Now then, if we are of that physical consciousness, and give power to physical might, then, of course, we are living uh, in fear of drafts and getting our feet wet. We are in fear of germs, weather, climate. It 
If we have gone into the mental state of consciousness, we probably want somebody's good thoughts to bless us, and of course we fear somebody's bad thoughts because they might harm us. We may be uncomfortable in the presence of people who we think are sinners, we don't like their thought upon us, or we may even fear a mental malpractitioner because we have given power to the mental powers. When you come to the spiritual consciousness, this is where you acknowledge that only God is power, only the consciousness which is not divided the consciousness that sees with a single eye, one power, one presence, one being, one cause. Ah, the moment you reach that, you reach life without effort. You reach, reach life by grace. Because now you don't have to consciously direct God consciousness. Now it performs its functions in you and through you, and you merely become aware of what it is imparting to you. Now, let us follow this for a moment. I've used this illustration many times. Let's use it again. This hand is absolutely dead. It can't go up, it can't go down, it can't give, it can't withhold, it can't punch, it can't pet. Here it is, and here it will stay forever, unless I. There's the big secret. I must move this hand. I must direct it. I must instruct it. I must empower it. Now, if I am down here on that physical or mental level, then I can do this for good or for evil. Now, I am choosing. If I have attained the, even a measure of the consciousness that God alone is power, then this hand is moved not by personal me, but by, by the divine I that I am, and never for evil, and never for error, never for destruction, never for harm, because I am not consciously going to move it, I am going to let it be moved by the consciousness which is God, which is the consciousness that I am. Now think of that. <clears throat> when you personally, humanly, are going to move your body. You can move it where you want, how you want, and you can move it for good or evil. The choice is within you. But in proportion, as you come to the realization that God is the only consciousness, and God is one power, infinity, immortality, eternality, you will find that your body is being moved. You consciously aren't moving it, it is being moved, and never for sin, and never for disease, and never for death, and never for old age. It is being moved in accord with the grace of God. When the time comes to pass from this human scene for greater experiences, it will be a passing, not a pushing out. Now, <clears throat> God is the one and only infinite consciousness, the all good, my consciousness. Therefore, everything within the realm of my consciousness is God-governed, God-maintained, God-sustained, 
God fed. God, divine consciousness, is the substance of all form. There is no evil form, there is no destructive form, no harmful form, no injurious form, for God is the substance of all form. Now you present to me a claim of infection or contagion, germ. But in this inner vision, I see God as the substance of all form. Therefore, there can be no destructive form, no injurious form, no harmful form. All form is of the name and nature of God. All form is of the quality of God, the activity of God, and exists under the law of God. And then I reach that inner stillness, and then we prove the germ was not destructive. I'm not denying that there are germs, there may be, but I know that they can't be injurious, they can't be destructive, not in the realization of one power, one intelligence, one love, one life. You present to me a claim of marital discord, and I say that God constitutes individual consciousness, therefore there can be no battle in consciousness, no disagreement, no separation. There can be no opposing interests, no opposition. God is infinite consciousness, the consciousness of you and of me, and there can be no discord between me and thee, for we are one. Whatever blesses me blesses you, because we are one. Anything that would injure you would injure me, for we are one. But God is the one. God is the one of you and God is the one of me. And in this oneness, there is only the qualities, the quantities, the activities and the laws of God. And nothing shall by any means enter this consciousness which I am, which you are, which he is, which she is, that defileth or maketh a lie. There is but one. And then again, that inner stillness and silence, and the seal is placed on that treatment, and so it is. Regardless of the name or nature of a claim which is brought to your awareness, you have to start with the fact that God is one, one presence, one being, one power, and all that God is, I am, and all that the Father hath is mine, therefore God consciousness is my consciousness, and nothing can enter my consciousness which despoileth, defileth, or maketh a lie. And so I know that God is the substance of all form. God is the activity of all being. God is the law unto all creation. And in him is no evil. In this truth of oneness, one being, one presence, one power, there are no opposing powers. And so we are dealing only with the belief, not your belief or mine, the universal belief in two powers, good and evil. But if you do not accept two powers, then you do not have the belief. And one with God is a majority. 
And where there is no belief in two powers, there is spiritual harmony, spiritual health, spiritual wholeness. This is why I caution the students, don't be satisfied if you've had a healing just because you have good health instead of bad health. Remember, good health can always become bad health. No, even good health must be transcended until you know that there is neither good health nor bad health. There is only spiritual health, God health. In other words, spiritual harmony, spiritual wholeness, spiritual completeness. Never be satisfied with just physical health or mental health. Never be satisfied with financial abundance. Because financial abundance can all too quickly be financial lack. Don't be satisfied with financial abundance. Translate it and realize that the only real abundance is the presence of God. God's presence is grace. God's presence is supply. God is the substance of all form. God is my being. That's why I shall not want. And then when you are abiding in this truth of spiritual substance, it will appear outwardly as the fulfilling, fulfillment of all your requirements, and there'll always be 12 baskets full left over. But not if you are going to count dollars or pounds or properties and think you have a sufficiency. Oh, no, no, time makes many changes. But if you recognize that in the kingdom of God, God itself is fulfillment, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom from all sense of lack and limitation, then you have made God your supply and your supply will be abundant. It will be infinite. But only if you've made God your supply, only if you've made God the health of your countenance. Don't be satisfied because the heart beats the right number of times. God is the health of my countenance. God is my supply. Don't be satisfied. I see in today's paper they're starting a new movement to be sure that we all buy concrete uh, shelters. Now we must all go out and buy concrete shelters. Don't be tempted. Don't be tempted. There's no place where God is not. If you have made God, your abiding place, your dwelling place, then that's where you are and that's where God is. And let's see somebody try to destroy God. God is infinite divine consciousness, therefore God is your individual consciousness. And this consciousness is the law unto your life. Don't try to direct it. Be satisfied that it is so and rest in that word. God is infinite divine consciousness. Therefore, God is my consciousness and your consciousness, his consciousness and her consciousness, the consciousness of friend and of foe, universal, divine, omnipresent being, God consciousness, the law unto all creation. And when you rest in that, it picks you up and transforms the mind, the body, and what is called the outer experience, but which now you learn isn't outer at all. It's all taking place within you.